And so, may we pray. Holy God, open our eyes to what you would have us see. Open our ears to what you would have us hear. And open our hearts to those whom you would have us love. Amen. In step three, we make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand God. In other words, we surrender. This week we read from the next chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and in today's passage we heard Jesus tell the story of a shrewd manager. The manager is in, in, in trouble with his boss, an employee, like the manager in first century Palestine, is more of a servant or a slave, and his boss is known as his master. When the boss hears a rumor that the employee is mismanaging his property, the manager has no recourse. We don't know whether he is guilty of squandering his boss's wealth, but we do know that he's scared. He has no other way of making a livelihood if he is fired, he will probably have to beg for his living. There is no way another property owner would take him on. So, the manager comes up with a scheme. He goes to his boss's debtors and offers them a deal. If they owe 100, let's make it 80 or even 50. He's buying some currency with these people. Writer Diana Butler Bass describes this system of gifting and gratitude called quid pro quo, literally meaning something for something. She says it was used as the means of patronage, power, and control. I do something for you so that you must do something for me. A gift incurred a debt, and the recipient owed a response, an act of gratitude in return. This works for the manager and it will give him an entrance into the home of the clients. It is, is his insurance policy if he is thrown out by his boss. Surprisingly though, the boss is pleased with the scheme. He is proud of his shrewd manager. Perhaps this scheme brings in owed wealth more quickly than before. Or perhaps the boss now feels he can call in favors from his clients. Don't you think this is a strange story for Jesus to tell? There is not much that is good or faithful in it. The manager and the boss act entirely in character and in the culture of the time. Things get even stranger as Jesus appears to recommend the behavior of the manager too. He says to the disciples, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. However, there is one subtlety in this statement that we would miss in many of the English translations of this gospel. In the telling of this story, Jesus says the manager acts so that people will welcome, them, welcome him into their homes or houses. But when Jesus comments on the story, advising the disciples, he says that when the wealth is gone, they may be welcomed into the eternal tents. The eternal tent or tabernacle is understood to be the dwelling place of God. And we are reminded that God is not to be found in earthly wealth or houses built by human hands. God is not so limited or settled. God's realm is other than this. And so Jesus seems to be saying, this may be a shrewd manager. He saved his skin and established goodwill with the clients. But what has he done to gain entrance into the eternal tents of God? This remains to be seen. Who does he truly serve? And so Jesus goes on to conclude that we cannot serve both God and material wealth. Well, sometimes we get confused. All things come from God. The environment, the food we eat, the homes we live in, the money we make. Alcohol comes from grape and grain, opiates from poppies. 
Opioids that are synthesized in the lab come from the created universe. There is nothing in our world that has not come from God's creation. If God is God, all else is created, and the created world is a gift. There is no real separation between God and what Jesus calls mammon. The problem arises when we begin to worship what is created instead of who is creating it. The problem arises when we seek security in the temporary homes of those who owe us favours. And this brings us to our addictions and the addictive behaviours we all own. Richard Rohr writes, Material satisfactions, while not surely bad, have a tendency to become addictive. Instead of making you whole, they repeatedly remind you of how incomplete, needy, and empty you are. As alcoholics often say, your addiction makes you need more and more of what is not working. We have begun working through the 12-step program of spirituality, following Richard Rohr's book, Breathing Underwater, and today we are on step three. And as I said, today's step is about surrender. And I remind you, Rohr says that surrender is not giving up, but giving to. It is reminding ourselves who is God, not the gift, but the giver. Surrender to God may sound scary, and yet it leads to joy. It leads to full appreciation of God's mercy and grace. It leads to dwelling in the eternal tents of God. Raw quotes St. Francis, who said, When the heart is pure, love responds to love alone. It has little to do with duty, obligation, requirements. God's love and mercy has nothing to do with quid pro quo. Raw says it is easy to surrender when you know there is nothing but love and mercy on the other side. But still, we resist, whether we have a chemical addiction or another addictive behaviour. We hold on to the illusion of being in control, and I wonder why. Some people I meet tell me that they practice spirituality but struggle with belief. I meet them here in church and many of the places I go in the community. Just recently, one young man told me that this was his struggle. Really, I think these are the people who are most likely on a true spiritual path towards surrender. The obstacle is simple and they have recognized it. It is a matter of their head and their reasoning getting in the way. A voice tells them that this is too good to be true. There is no God of love and mercy. I usually say, don't worry about it. God doesn't need your belief. Keep doing what works. Eventually, the need for belief will melt away. You will surrender. But these are the easy ones. Other people I meet have a much more difficult obstacle. They are also both inside the church and outside, and they are sure they know who God is, and they want no part of surrendering. They are locked in a battle of wills. They may think that God wants them to attend church, but they stay away until guilt gets the better of them. Or they think that God wants is after all of their money, and they don't want to give it. Or they think that God wants to get inside their heads, and they want to keep God out. The parables and teachings of Jesus offend them. They do not want to relinquish control over their lives. And isn't it true that we here today are all a little bit like this? We conjure images of a demanding, control freak God. In the distant memories of childhood, I swing my legs from the pew in my small Methodist chapel of 1960s England. And the message from the great high pulpit resounds, God wants you, and God wants your all. At that time, my understanding of giving one's all to God meant becoming a missionary. And my understanding of mission was an expedition to preach the gospel in those so-called heathen nations. 
I had heard about these places in the old hymns we would sing. The implication was that God would call me to give up on all my attachments, hopes and dreams and to substitute an alien disturbing future. No wonder I resisted. Over the years, I have often thought of surrender as meaning that God would drag me kicking and screaming into submission like a two-year-old in a tantrum. But life experiences, mentors, and further study of the scriptures, as well as books like Breathing Underwater have changed my understanding. Yes, God does sometimes call us out of our comfort zones to metaphorical distant lands. God does want our all, our whole lives. And yet to surrender to God looks more like giving ourselves over to a winsome beloved than a control freak. Resistance comes from fears that we have accumulated over the course of our lives. We learn to fear when we are let down or hurt by those we have loved before. When the winsome beloved comes along, we convince ourselves that we don't deserve them and they will find out soon enough. We ask how we will survive when that person leaves or abandons us. Self-loathing kicks in. It is our protective mechanism. We'd rather use it than believe ourselves to be loved without condition. The good news is that if we surrender to the winsome lover that is God, we will become equipped to face the truth without fear or denial. In our lives, this might mean seeking help for something that is causing our health to suffer, a chemical addiction, a destructive relationship, or a past trauma that we cannot get beyond. In our culture, this might mean listening to the young people who are crying out for the generation in power to take climate change seriously. Here in our church, this might mean questioning our thinking of how we are church and the way we so often channel our energies and resources into a temporary house rather than the eternal tabernacle. No, God's gifts are not given quid pro quo. We do not owe God. We simply deny ourselves God's overwhelming grace when we act as though we do. And so, may we surrender all and let God be God, because we are not. May all God's people say, Amen. Amen.